So every single year, there's a player who comes into the NFL and completely takes over from day one, just plants his flag. And that player is usually given the prestigious Rookie of the Year award. And while some of these players continue on that same trajectory, there are just as many, if not more cases of guys who all but disappear only a few years later. Today, we're taking a look at the last 10 rookies of the year, all on the offensive side of the ball. If you also wanna see me do the defensive rookies, man, make sure you liking this video, make sure you're sharing it, you know, all that cool YouTube stuff. Subscribe to the channel, XYZ, you already know what's up. So today, we're gonna dive into the historic rookie seasons that won these guys the highest honor that can be bestowed on a first year player. But we're also gonna take a look at how their careers have progressed since they won the award. I'm Flim Low Raps, and this is the last 10 Offensive Rookie of the Year winners. Where are they now? But other than that, y'all already know what time it is, bros. Cue the way. All right, real quick before we jump into the video, time for a word from today's video sponsor, Raycon. So Raycon's everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound way better than ever before. And these new gel tips help them to fit perfectly in your ears with A1 comfort. And bro, once they in, they will not budge. Like they ain't coming out. Like you can, see what I'm saying? Like even if you wanna get crazy, say you wanna just shake the dreads, bro. I'm dizzy as hell, but as dizzy as I am, they still in there. Like you'll honestly be to hurt your damn neck before these earbuds come out. You can usually catch me with a pair of these in when I'm out solo. It's really just a good way to be somewhere physically, but be in a whole different space mentally. Now, sometimes I leave them in a car and forget to charge them, but these little mugs got a 32 hour battery life and they give you eight hours of playtime. So to my gym bros out there, you can get as many sets and reps as you need, bro. These will not die on you and they will not fall out. Not to mention, you ain't even gotta break the bank with these. You're getting A1 quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands, which is probably why Raycon has over 48,000 five-star reviews. So if you're trying to grab you a pair, click the link in the description box, or go to buyraycon.com slash flimlo to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Man, shout out to Raycon once again for sponsoring the video. Without further ado, let's get it. Back in 2011, NFL quarterbacks looked a whole lot different than they do today. While today's league offers you great variety at the position, back then most of the consensus best quarterbacks in the league all had extremely similar play styles. Of course there were things that separated them like Peyton's pre-snap genius, Breeze's timing, footwork and accuracy, and Aaron Rodgers' golden arm. But the point I'm making is that nearly all of the best quarterbacks were of the drop back variety. For the most part, they were pocket passers who were pretty statuesque. Don't believe me? Let's take a look at the 2011 Pro Bowl. You had Tom Brady, Eli Manning. That was actually Peyton's last year with the Colts, so he set out that season with an injury, but of course he would have been there. You had Phillip Rivers, Andy Dalton, and the two most mobile Pro Bowl quarterbacks that year was Aaron Rodgers and Big Ben. Or at least they would have been, if not for that year's Rookie of the Year. Superman himself, Cam Newton. Cam came into the league shrouded in controversy stemming from his college days, but he was also shrouded in talent, swag, a national championship, and a Heisman Trophy. The Carolina Panthers took him first overall in the 2011 NFL Draft, and in his NFL debut, Dude became the first rookie ever to throw for over 400 yards in his very first NFL outing. This actually broke the rookie debut passing yards record previously held by Peyton Manning. Bro, the NFL had never seen anything like Cam Newton. I mean, sure, you had Randall Cunningham, Cordell Stewart, and of course, Michael Vick. QBs who could throw it well, but were most feared for their running ability. And then you also had a cat like Big Ben who had the size and strength to shrug off defenders in the pocket, break out of a couple of sacks and extend plays, but never had the league seen it all in one package. Bro, straight up, defenses didn't know what to do with this man. And he was, in a lot of ways, the prerequisite for many of the day's QBs who are big, have strong arms, and can really move. With Cam's size, athleticism, and fearlessness, Dude was more deadly around the goal line than an old school fullback, but seeing Cam sky into the end zone was a hell of a lot more exciting. Dude took the NFL by storm and set a new record for rushing touchdown by a quarterback with 14 in his first year. All that plus Cam's unique style shined a light on him that wasn't just bright, it was damn near blinding. He finished the season with 4,051 yards through the air, 
35 total touchdowns and 17 picks. That means as a rookie, he was top 10 in passing yards in the entire league amongst all veterans. He also made the Pro Bowl as a rookie and was of course named Offensive Rookie of the Year or we wouldn't be talking about him on this video. Now since then, Cam's career has had his ups and downs. In 2015, he won the league's MVP award and led his team not went for a ride, but led his team all the way to Super Bowl 50. And that's where the savvy old head paid Manning came back for revenge for Cam breaking his rookie record all those years ago. And it's kind of funny because that Super Bowl was seven years ago and Von Miller is still breaking the bank in free agency. So you already know, Cam was up against it. Following that 2015 season, Cam seemed to regress. And as the league failed to protect him with flags even in the pocket, along with Cam's refusal to go down easily, even in situations when the play was completely lost, those two things led to injuries stacking up which proved to be Superman's kryptonite over the years. Then he had a brief run with the Patriots that wasn't terrible, but also wasn't great. And at that point, it was pretty clear to everybody that the Cam Newton of old was no more. Last season, he made a return to Carolina, facing the Arizona Cardinals, same team he faced in his very first NFL game. And while he didn't have a 400 plus yard record-breaking day that he had as a rookie, he did manage to throw a touchdown pass and run for another. And for those two very brief moments, Superman was back. Today, Cam Newton is a fixture in NFL history as a trendsetter and a man who changed the position in a lot of ways. Like I said earlier, you can look at a Josh Allen and see a lot of early Cam Newton, and there are several other quarterbacks now who are of that same mold. But now at 32 years of age, Cam's not the same player that he once was as a rookie. His physical conditioning is still top tier, but cardio is one thing and playing at the MVP level is another. Today, you'll find Cam coaching youth football as he loves being around and energy and his wardrobe has changed drastically over the years and he even launched the luxury hat collection in 2021. In 2019 he also opened a cigar bar in his hometown of Atlanta Georgia which looks dope and if you're looking for more of Cam's story from the time he started playing football back when he was a kid all the way through those ups and downs of the college days and the height of his career in the NFL I've actually covered his rise and fall in much more detail in my what happened to Cam Newton video which I'll pop up on the screen at the end of this one. Now 2012 was the year of Robert Griffin III. Like Cam, he was riding high coming into the league after winning the Hoffman Trophy. The league even changed his rules to allow for his signature, the third Roman numeral, to go in the back of his jersey. He was actually the first player in history to do that. Still, the second overall pick has some serious competition for the Rookie of the Year award in the form of the first overall pick. Andrew Luck. And while Luck threw for more yards, RG3 was far more efficient that year. He finished with a completion percentage of 65.6. That was 11% higher than Luck's 54.1. Luck also threw for a few more touchdowns than RG3. But I want you to check out these interception totals. 20 touchdowns and only 5 picks for a rookie is pretty crazy. And I haven't even mentioned his 815 rushing yards and 7 more scores on the ground. His season totals look insane bro, 4,000 plus total yards, 27 touchdowns and only 5 picks. But dude wasn't a perfect player by any stretch. Despite not throwing many interceptions, he did lose 8 fumbles that year as his slide game was just never up to snuff. And RG3's early success largely hinged on his read option offense brought in straight from the college football world as it took defenses some time to catch up but before they had the opportunity to do that dude ran off and won rookie of the year all while leading his team to a wild card spot now of course once they got there they run into the legion of boom literally the stuff of nightmares for a rookie quarterback he ended up re-injuring his knee in that game it was all a pretty tough way to end the season despite that rg3's first year in the league was pretty damn phenomenal but after making a Pro Bowl and being named Rookie of the Year, RG3's career quickly went downhill. And unlike Cam, who had more highs and then lows, RG3's was a pretty smooth ride downward. His high running posture had a lot to do with it, as it greatly affected his short area quickness and ability to avoid hits. Couple that with the fact that he just couldn't slide for some reason and you can easily see why the injuries piled up. And after that first year or two, you can see that he would even run with a noticeable limp. So check this out, for the first five years of his career where he actually took the field at all, with each coming season, he actually played in less games than he played in the year before. So in 2012, he played in 15 games. 2013, 13 games. Then he played in nine games in 2014, 
missed 2015 completely, and then only played in five games in 2016, missed 2017 with injury once again, and then in 2018, played in three games. Now to be fair, by 2018, he was a backup, but still, like that trend is insane. He ended his career with dignity though and became a great mentor for Lamar Jackson in his final three years. He then transitioned into broadcasting, signing a lucrative multi-year deal with ESPN, and he's become mostly known for kind of smugly delivering takes that are sometimes spot on, but sometimes leave you going, bro, what, what the hell RG3 talking about? Nonetheless, he had an amazing rookie year and he looks to have a nice second career going as well, so that's what's up. So in 2013, we get a change of pace, as Eddie Lacy is the first non-quarterback on this list. The Alabama running back won three BCS national titles in college, but wasn't selected until the second round of the draft in part because his love of the game was questioned. He even admitted that he didn't watch football on TV at all, which still kind of blows my mind till this day. You know, seeing as how he was an NFL running back. And some people may feel that it's not really a big deal, but when you really think about it bro without that true passion for the game beyond just playing on Sundays I think teams now understand that despite drafting a guy really high or paying him a lot of money you're still gonna have to constantly motivate him to be at his very best take that in contrast to a guy who loves football so much that you basically can't keep him out of the facility you can't stop him from working on his game. If you really put yourself in the team's position for just a second, you can see why you choose the latter over the former. And I don't mean to be overly critical, but just from a common sense standpoint, I think reasonable people should be able to understand that. The NFL is a grind, and if you're not 100% in, it's going to be really hard to commit yourself to staying in the top shape year-round. But when he was focused, Eddie Lacy's talent was top-notch, and when he was right, dude was a beast. In his very first season, he won up the previous two entries on this list. Not only did he make the Pro Bowl as a rookie, dude was second team all pro. He rushed for 1,178 yards and 11 scores, and he looked like he would be a force over in Green Bay for years to come. But after his second season in the league, his weight became a massive problem. Dude often tweeted about his love for Chinese food, which seems like absolutely nothing until you show up to training camp 30 pounds overweight. And once again, I covered this in much more detail in my What Happened to Eddie Lacy video, and I'll pop up a playlist of all these cats that I've covered at the end of this video. But essentially, as harsh as this sounds, just like I put on a thumbnail back then, he kind of ate himself out of the league. He got woefully out of shape, which led to injuries, some of which required surgeries. During those recovery periods, he predictably gained even more weight. Then he did what so many of us do. I know I've done it a couple of times myself. He basically yo-yo dieted, where he goes on these crazy diets and restricts his calories all the way down, cranks the cardio all the way up, and end up losing 30 pounds in a month. And then, just like clockwork, you gain it all back and then some because you greatly slow down your metabolism and now your body expects you to do all of that crap you did to lose this 30 pounds if you want to stay there that's why it's best to just take a slow methodical approach but i get it it's tough because you want the results now and he eventually got really down on himself as he just couldn't keep the weight off and as the internet comments flooded in on the daily it eventually breaks through that wall you put up and it starts to weigh on your self-esteem and confidence and as sad as it is this essentially drove eddie lacy out of the league man today eddie's in a much healthier place both mentally and physically he's cleaned up his relationship with food by focusing on his mental health sleep quality and nutrition and he announced a few months back that his new career would be spreading the importance of mental and physical wellness and i actually think that's extremely dope of course people will say oh you should have did this or if i was in the nfl i would have did that but at the end of the day life is a whole lot more than a game and i'm happy my dude is in a much better state so that he can not only find peace but be around longer for his family and loved ones not to mention with him speaking on mental and physical wellness how many people have been both a national champion in college multiple times and an nfl pro bowl running back so i think it's cool because he can speak directly to a lot of ex-athletes who deal with these exact same issues now 2014's rookie of the year is a guy who's become one of the biggest stars in the league both on and off the field of course i'm talking about 
Odell Beckham Jr., who only played 12 games as a rookie, but that was all it took to finish in the top 10 in the NFL in receptions, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns. During his rookie season, he also made the catch, like one of the greatest catch any of us have ever seen. It basically just skyrocketed him to next level superstardom. It only took this man one season to get put on the cover of Madden and really he changed the entire way that game played if you remember. Everybody was making spectacular one handed catches cause you just had to see it every damn play. He was actually the youngest player to ever grace that prestigious cover and no matter what you think about the game itself, being on that cover is still a big deal. It's been a tradition for some of the league's best players for over 20 years now. But with all of that said, Odell's rise was so meteoric. I mean, an overcorrection was almost guaranteed, right? What goes up must come down type of thing. But it wasn't immediate. His second year, he actually improved, performing at the same level, but remaining healthier than year one. Year three was more the same, but he got injured again in year four. And as we all know, injuries would become a recurring issue for Odell. But despite that, at one point, his stardom was so damn ridiculous that his pregame warmup would go viral every single week. It's, it's his pregame warmup and people was going nuts. I mean, people just couldn't get enough of this dude, but usually when you overindulge, even your favorite song can start to give you a headache, you know what I'm saying? The media and fans alike began to sour on OBJ over time, dare I say, Predictably, the infamous Miami trip and corresponding boat picture prior to a playoff game was the exact ammo the media needed to turn dude into a full-fledged heel. Odell didn't help the narrative at all as he had an awful game and even had several uncharacteristic drops and he had extremely low production as the Giants got blown out by Green Bay. Now another heel moment was that on-field fight with him and Josh Norton which seemed to last forever. It was a terrible look because it wasn't just one spur of the moment thing. Like nah bro, it dragged on for what felt like a whole quarter. And I was just cringing looking at my TV like somebody please get these dudes out the game before they do something that they're not gonna be able to reverse. His time in Cleveland was also marred in controversy as he never looked like the same Odell from New York. He struggled to connect with Baker Mayfield and eventually forced his way out of town when his dad dropped the mashup video of Baker Mayfield just constantly missing a wide open Odell over and over and over again. And let's be real, it was just never a good fit from the jump. But this past year, Odell landed on his feet with the LA Rams, an A-plus destination for the young star that fit like one of his oversized gloves. He was now a star in the land of stars, as opposed to being a star in Cleveland where he stuck out like a sore thumb. I was personally extremely happy to see him get with the Rams and once again have success and have moments where he looked like the old Odell. Even as a late addition, he helped them along their playoff run and was able to add Add a Super Bowl championship to his resume, which as a Bengals fan, I was a lot less happy to see. I'm gonna be real. But if it had to happen, if we had to lose, I'd rather it be Odell instead of some receiver that I don't even like. I've been a fan of dude for a long time. He did unfortunately re-tear his ACL that he had worked so hard to get back from in that game. And coincidentally, both of his ACL injuries occurred in games against my Bengals. That's kind of tough. He's currently a free agent, but I kind of hope he goes back to the Rams as it seems like such a great fit for him. But if no news is dropped by the time I hit upload on this video, we'll just have to wait and see. Now 2015's rookie of the year when I say the name might actually seem like he played way back in the early 2000s, but in all actuality, it wasn't that long ago at all. Some of y'all already know I'm talking about another former Rams player running back Ty Gurley. But after being named the league's best offensive player only seven years back, today, Ty Gurley is completely out of the NFL. Early on in his career, nobody would have ever guessed how his future would go, especially not the Rams. See, back in 2015, today's Hollywood Rams were still in St. Louis. And back then, they actually used to use their draft picks in a conventional way. 
In 2014, they took Aaron Donald, who's still a staple of that franchise. And then the following year, 2015, they take Todd Gurley, another player thought to be a future staple of the team. His first four games in the NFL actually made him look like geniuses. Although some had questioned the pick due to Todd's torn ACL suffered during his final year in college, he showed zero signs of it early on in his NFL career. Through his first four NFL games, this man rushed for 566 yards, the most by any player ever in their first four NFL contests. He finished the season with 1,106 yards and 10 touchdowns and was named a pro bowler in his very first season. Then after a sophomore slump in 2016, the Rams hired Sean McVay, and then once again, the Ty Gurley stock was on a rocket. So after winning Offensive Rookie of the Year in 2015, he won Offensive Player of the Year in 2017. And in both 2017 and 2018, he was named First Team All-Pro, made the Pro Bowl, and led the league in rushing touchdowns. He was considered by most to be the very best the league has to offer at the running back position. But unfortunately, life sometimes comes at you with 4-3 speed. Considering what would happen next, Todd was really fortunate to sign the contract that he did. Until this day, it's still pretty unusual for a running back, which honestly is probably because of the Todd Gurley situation. Had it worked out better, you'd probably see running backs get a little bit more guaranteed money, but it just didn't work out. So basically, he got a $60 million extension with 45 mil guaranteed making him the highest paid player in the league at that position. But by the end of that very same season, Gurley's attempts had gotten so low that it sparked tons of questions from fans and media alike. So it was rumored that he had some mysterious injury, and in 2019, it was finally reported that he developed arthritis in that left knee, the same one that he'd previously injured. Once again, if you want more on this one, I do have a What Happened To video. He still actually managed to rush for 857 yards, but it was clear that the $60 million man was no longer the player that he once was. So he played 15 games with the Falcons in 2020, but he wasn't signed by anybody last year. And with the rate that teams like the Baltimore Ravens, for instance, was losing running backs last year, for them to not even bring Todd in, I, I felt that was pretty telling. Not to mention his own former team lost Cam Akers for most of the season, they also didn't bring him in. So with that being said, at this point, it seems like Todd Gurley's NFL career may be over. Today, Todd seems to be enjoying his time off as much as he can, doing some charity work along with a few brand deals. And I noticed that in one of these commercials, he's actually shown doing some hiking, which means his knee's not so bad to where he can't move around. And at 27, he might still have some left in the tank. But is there any team out there who's willing to give the three-time All-Pro another shot? We'll see. In 2016, Dak Prescott walked into the league as a fourth round pick who carried himself like a five year vet. At first glance, it appears he just inherited this great situation with a phenomenal offensive line and a great running game in Dallas. But the one thing he didn't inherit immediately, at least, was the starting job. Unlike many first round picks, Dak Prescott was the eighth quarterback taken that year, so nobody was expecting him to come in and get the starting job right off the bat. He actually began camp as the fourth string QB behind longtime Cowboys starter Tony Romo and current Cowboys coach Kellen Moore, who was still playing at the time. He was also behind second year quarterback Jamil Showers, so he had a lot of movement that he needed to do. Then two of his teammates' misfortune actually led to Dak being in a pretty fortunate situation. Both Tony Romo and Kellen Moore went down with injuries before the season even kicked off. Then the fourth rounder beat out Jamil Showers and then was instantly thrust into one of the hottest seats in the NFL, the Dallas Cowboys starting quarterback. To almost everybody's surprise, dude handled it with a level of class and grace that was really unheard of not only for a rookie but one drafted so late. He had an almost presidential aura about him the perfect face of the franchise who was always in the spotlight. With all of that said, Dax had his public tribulations from dealing with mental struggles after losing his mom and the terrible injury that I'll talk about in just a second. So basically, we've seen him down, but we've never seen him out. On the field, he wasn't flashy, protected the ball, made smart throws, and allowed his run game and great old line to lead the way. In his very first season, he led the Cowboys to a 13-3 record made the Pro Bowl and was, of course, named Offensive Rookie of the Year. 
with perhaps his biggest competition being the guy he was handing the ball off to. Over the next few seasons, Dak actually morphed into more of a high volume passer. And in 2019, he looked like one of the league's very best, throwing for nearly 5,000 yards, 30 touchdowns with only 11 picks. Going into the 2021 season, Dak actually signed a $160 million contract with 126 mil guaranteed. A huge payday for a cat who was once an afterthought for the Cowboys. He fought his way up to the top, but staying there, that would be the challenge. In 2020, Dak suffered one of the most gruesome injuries we've seen on a football field. And while he looked pretty good in his return this past season, he actually seemed a lot more hesitant to run the ball than he had in the past, which is understandable. But when you're taking away one of your best assets as a player, it's usually gonna create a problem. In the playoffs, it was even worse, as he just seemed so damn flustered, really for the first time in his career. I'd never seen him look like that. Overreacting to perceived pressure and making uncharacteristic characteristic mistakes. Then in his post-game presser, he strayed away from his typical presidential delivery and actually praised fans for throwing objects at the refs following the game. This was despite looking woefully underprepared following an ill-advised quarterback draw with only seconds left in the fourth quarter. And it was crazy because the man refused to run the entire game and then finally took off at the worst possible time. It was very undak like So in 2022, Dak will be looking to once again reach his top form. And he's generally such a likable and respectable dude, even with all the hate the Cowboys get, it's kind of hard not to root for him. And at only 28 years old, he's got a whole lot of history left to write. Now, 2017's Rookie of the Year was New Orleans Saints running back Alvin Kamara, cat who's most recently been in the news for an assault case that took place during his most recent Pro Bowl weekend. Up to that point, though, dude had been a model citizen in the NFL, despite being, you know, a little eccentric, I guess, for the league. So here's something crazy, and I didn't even realize this until researching this video. Bro, Alvin Kamara has never rushed for a thousand yards, like ever, in the NFL, which seems insane, but despite that, he's still a two-time all-pro running back and a five-time pro bowler. How? Well, the answer is pretty damn simple. The pass game. Despite not hitting the typical rushing yard mark for most of the good running backs, his overall production still remains towards the top of the league. For the first four years of Dude's career, he averaged over 100 targets, 80 receptions, and 700 yards per season in the pass game. That's literally more than some number two receivers get in the NFL. And when Drew Brees was there, most of those passes were really just extended handoffs, check downs into the flats and things like that, although he does make some down the field catches at times. As a rookie, Dude became the first player in Saints history to gain 700 plus yards both rushing and receiving bringing a special kind of value to the game. And despite splitting time with his good friend Mark Ingram, dude finished his rookie season with over 1,900 all-purpose yards and 14 touchdowns, which was enough for him to be named second team all-pro and a pro bowler as a rookie. In 2020, he signed the $77 million contract extension with about 34 million guarantees, as the Saints were sure to recognize and appreciate his value to the squad. That same season, he actually tied a record for most rushing touchdowns in a game with six. And I'ma look this up after recording it, but if my memory serves, he had an opportunity to get the seventh touchdown and break the record outright, but Sean Payton decided to instead give the goal line carry to Taysom Hill. And I hope I'm wrong about that. I really hope I'm wrong about that. All right, future me has looked it up and I wasn't wrong. Regardless, this man is one of the smoothest runners in the league, changing speeds and directions with a fluidity that even amongst the best athletes in the world still stands alone on Sundays. It's actually somewhat reminiscent of another Saints running back from the previous regime. Now, the hearing for the alleged assault incident at the Pro Bowl takes place in April, so following this whole thing, Kamara may actually have to repair his image a little bit. Also out on the field, he seemed a little less productive last year, playing alongside Jameis Winston, who's more prone to throw the ball down the field as opposed to the Drew Brees checkdowns, but also Kamara wasn't 100%. Dude is still one of the most talented guys in the league, and hopefully he comes back this year fully healthy and refocused once his case is resolved. And after that, he should just continue stacking up records and accolades for years to come, hopefully.
So in 2018, Saquon Barkley destroyed the NFL Combine. Dude was an athletic freak who could squat damn near 600 pounds for reps. And his lower body strength wasn't just for show either. At 233 pounds, this man ran a 4-4 flat in the 40-yard dash. And he was able to couple his crazy burst and agility on field with insane power as well. He also bench pressed 225 for 29 reps. For a perspective, Aaron Donald only did it six more times than that. This man is a running back, dog. A running back that ran a 4-4 flat, okay? That kind of speed and power and athleticism just not really supposed to exist in one dude, but it does. His name is Saquon. In his very first season, dude looked like one of the best running backs in the league. And it didn't take too long for people to realize it because in his very first start, dude ended up busting a 68-yard touchdown run that showed every tool in the bag vision, ability to run through arm tackles, elusiveness, and speed. And then in his second game, he showed off a different skill, 14 receptions, which was the most for any rookie running back in league history. Dude had hands. Now his change of direction without losing power is probably my favorite Saquon trait. Like when you see him run, it's just like, okay, that's what an NFL running back is supposed to look like. He capped off his season with 1,300 yards rushing, which is impressive, right? But then he also caught 91 passes for another 721 yards, putting him over 2,000 all-purpose yards, not to mention he got in the end zone 15 times. Now, we just finished talking about Alvin Kamara and how impressive it is that he's super productive in both the pass game and the run game. Well, Saquon as a rookie did something something that Kamara has never done, rushed for over a thousand yards and still had over 700 yards receiving. Just to put things in perspective on how special this dude was as a rookie, he easily ran away with the Rookie of the Year award and was named to the Pro Bowl. That first season was truly the year of Saquon Barkley. Dude even got his own holiday called Saquon Barkley Day back in his hometown state of Pennsylvania. Now year two looked mostly the same. Only now with Odell Beckham getting shipped off to Cleveland, defenses could key on Saquon even more. Not that it mattered initially as he had a very similar year statistically, still going over a thousand yards on the ground and 400 yards in the receiving game despite missing three contests. But then the following year he tears his ACL. And to be honest, he really hasn't been the same ever since. In 2021, he came back from the ACL injury, but before he could really get his full Saquon burst back, he ended up hurting his ankle and really seemed hampered for the whole season. Not even gaining a thousand yards with both rushing and receiving combined. But he's only 25 years old and there's a good chance that he gets back to the old Saquon in this upcoming season. But the Giants may actually feel differently as there have been rumors of dude getting traded. But no matter where Saquon lands, if healthy, dude is a problem. So in 2019, there was this kid out of Oklahoma with a lot of draft controversy surrounding him. That kid's name was Kyler Murray, and despite his stated commitment to the game of football, many analysts and teams felt a little leery about the fact that he could just opt to play baseball instead. This was because not only was he taken in the Major League Baseball draft, he was actually drafted ninth overall by the Oakland A's, making him a top 10 pick in two professional sports. That's pretty damn crazy. Despite his height also being a big topic of discussion, Kyler was taken first overall by the Arizona Cardinals in the 2019 draft. And in his first two NFL contests, he threw for over 300 yards, quickly proving that his height would not hold him back from playing in this league. He finished his very first season with 3,722 yards through the air, 20 touchdowns and 12 picks. His athleticism, short area quickness, and overall speed translated well as he rushed for nearly 550 yards and four additional touchdowns on the ground. And while it wasn't nearly as much of a talking point for some reason, dude did that while being tied for the most sacked quarterback in the league that year. He was sacked 48 times in the regular season, compared that to Joe Burrow's infamous 2021, and we're only talking the difference of three regular season sacks. He improved all of his notable numbers in 2020 and held steady in 2021. He was showing a level of consistency that most quarterbacks never do. But while statistically he was proven to be overall consistent, there was another consistent trend developing as well. So in 2019, when Kyler was drafted, the Cardinals were bad. But in 2020, they were at worst a mid-level team. And many people thought they could make the playoffs. 
but after a 6-3 start, they went 2-5 over their last seven games. Following year rolls around, and the Cardinals were once again expected to make the playoffs, and this time, actually make some noise. And they did end up making it, but bro, it was not pretty. They actually started the season off 7-0, but then the next seven games where Kyler started, they went 2-5, once again, melting down in the latter parts of the season. Still, they snuck into the playoffs and Kyler had what I believe was his worst NFL performance. I know I said the same thing about Dak, but I was really disturbed by both of their playoff appearances this year. They looked real bad in those. Kyler looked frantic, had happy feet, and pretty much abandoned all of his fundamentals. The Cardinals ended up getting crushed and their ascending number one overall quarterback looked like a rookie. But while he looked like a rookie in that game, he no longer wanted to get paid like one. Turns out he wanted a new contract one year early and following his worst performance ever, he immediately started pulling stunts like unfollowing the Cardinals on Instagram. He later posted a long confusing post where he kind of apologized but the whole thing honestly made him look pretty bad and none of his teammates were coming to his aid publicly which made him look even worse. Next thing you know, reports of him being selfish in the locker room began to surface and people's view of Kyler quickly took a big dip, with some going as far as to say that his day-to-day -day interactions were more that of a baseball player just focused on me as opposed to an NFL quarterback who has to focus on the entire team. Still, he's crazy talented and his faults aren't big enough for the Cardinals to bail on him. They're going to look to work through these issues and with Deshaun Watson coming off of his legal situation and getting $230 million guaranteed, it's going to be hard to convince Kyler and his agent that he too doesn't deserve a huge sum of money. So 2020 was supposed to be the year of Tua. Tank for Tua signs was showing up all over stadiums of bad teams the year before. But by the time the draft rolled around, Tua's injury and Joe Burrow's meteoric rise had pretty much changed all of that. But the entire time, there was a dude lurking in the background who had once been considered the no-brainer number one quarterback of his class, Justin Herbert. Now, Justin Herbert had the opportunity to come out in 2019, and many people believe he would have been the number one overall pick in that draft class. But he decided to go back to Oregon and ended up having an underwhelming season. And while nobody denied he had all the physical tools, his intangibles were heavily questioned as he was said to not be a good leader and some even called the man soft. After seeing him bust up NFL defenses, of course that all seems blasphemous now, but the truth is he was absolutely a boomer bust prospect, but so far in the NFL, it's been 100% boom. But in college, Oregon had weirdly used him in a way that minimized his strengths and maximized his weaknesses, the opposite of how you should use a player. So when the draft rolled around, Herbert was the third quarterback taken, sixth overall by the Chargers. Now one of the things you've commonly heard me repeat is that there's little to no upside in returning to college for that dreaded senior season if you're already considered a first round pick as a junior. The chances of you moving up even more are slim and you've got injury risk or the risk of having a down year. Well, Herbert may be the exception to the rule, even though had he come out in 2020, he would have likely gone first overall to the Cardinals, which would have actually been an extremely solid destination. And even considering how good Keenan Allen and Mike Williams are, can you imagine this man playing with D-Hop? With all of that said, Kyler didn't get Arizona to the playoffs until year three, and with Justin Herbert getting so close last year, he seems to be on pretty much the same pace. Not to mention with what the Chargers just did in free agency, if I'm judging it today, it looks like staying another year may have worked out in his favor. But of course, we'll have to see. His NFL debut was actually pretty crazy, seemed like something out of a movie. And honestly, most of y'all probably already know the story. But in case you don't, a terrible Chargers team doctor actually punctured Tyrod Taylor's lung while giving him a shot right before the game. And just like that, Tyrod was rushed to the damn hospital and Justin Herbert was thrown into the starting lineup. By all accounts, this should have gone horribly, but Herbert actually ended up looking pretty good, throwing for over 300 yards in his first game with one touchdown and one interception. He wasn't perfect, but his talent popped off the screen. He was big, strong, athletic, and his arm was insane. Of course, after that first start, Duke never relinquished the position. As the NFL seemed to suit a lot of his strengths a whole lot better than the college offense that he was running. 
In most years, he would have been a runaway rookie of the year, but he was actually in a dogfight for quite a while. He had to not only battle another quarterback in Joe Burrow, but wide receiver Justin Jefferson also had a historic rookie season. On the QB side, both Herbert and Burrow were playing great through October, and at one point it looked as if Joey had the edge. But Herbert began to really take the lead in November, and we're talking even before Burrow ended up getting hurt. And even though I'm a diehard Bengals fan whose favorite player just happens to be my own quarterback, in order to be fair and objective, I did feel like I had to point that out. Because even though Joey is still the GOAT, at the time my boy Joe Shiesty went down, he and Herbert had damn near the exact same amount of passing yards. Herbert had 2699, Joey had 2688. They also had virtually the same number of interceptions, but the difference came on the touchdown side of things where Herbert had about nine more scores than Burrow had at the time. Now, if Joe doesn't get hurt, who knows how things turn out? But since Joe's season stopped right there, if we judged him just up to that point, Herbert would have the edge because of the touchdowns. Kind of pains me to say, but you know, it is what it is. But then of course, after after Burrow's injury, Herbert showed no signs of slowing down, looking better and better as the season progressed, as you would expect. He finished the year with 4,336 yards, 31 touchdowns, and 10 picks as a rookie, becoming only the fourth quarterback in history to ever accomplish such a feat. He then followed it up with an even better sophomore season statistically, this time reaching 5,000 yards in only his second year. He put up 38 touchdowns and 15 picks, and he was also named to the 2021 Pro Bowl. The Chargers, however, have failed to make the playoffs in both seasons, which have slightly devalued Herbert's crazy stats. But if you saw his final game versus the Raiders this past season, the box score is kind of weird, true enough. He ended up throwing 64 passes and only completing about half of them. But with that said, he threw for 383 yards, three touchdowns, and he only turned it over once. He converted third and fourth downs time and time again. He showed a whole lot of grit and a whole lot of heart. He showed leadership and that he did have a dog in him that some people question in a game that could have sent the Chargers to the playoffs. And even though he's yet to get into the postseason, I think that game may have actually silenced some of his critics, even though the team ultimately came up short. Not to mention Brandon Staley could have gone for the tie, which would have also placed the Chargers in the playoffs, but he oddly and maybe stupidly decided to go for the win and ended up coming up empty. So the 2022 season is gonna be huge for Justin Herbert, because after a series of splash moves and free agency, the LA Chargers have now given him everything he needs to make a deep playoff run. But regardless to what happens this year, Herb is looking to erase any remaining doubt that he does deserve to be mentioned amongst the very best quarterbacks in the league. Now I mentioned how Justin Jefferson had a historic season in 2020 but ended up losing out on the award as Justin Herbert took it home. But little did anybody know that Justin Jefferson's college teammate would show up the very next year and break all of his records like it was absolutely nothing. Jamar Chase opted out of his final college season and that whole time Jefferson was tearing up the league, Chase was just training and waiting his turn. When the draft finally rolled around, the so-called experts in the mainstream media and and on Twitter insisted that the Bengals should take Panay Sewell basically just because Joe Burrow got injured the year before. There was even one guy who went as far as to say that the Bengals organization should be disbanded as a team if they selected the quote unquote flashy wide receiver instead of an offensive tackle. But the thing that people greatly slept on was the fact that Chase wasn't your average first round receiver. This man is generational. The opportunity to pair that guy with his college quarterback that he broke records with and won a national championship in hindsight really just seems like a no-brainer. But at the time, this was one of the most scrutinized moves in recent draft history. Chase gritty to the podium on draft night, magically already decked out in orange and black shoes. A touchdown dance that people would get to see about 14 more times during that upcoming season. But before he got to that point, he ended up having some struggles in the preseason. While only playing a few snaps, Jamar Chase dropped nearly every one of his targets during the preseason. He was no joke called a bust by a lot of quote unquote credible people. 
But by the time week one rolled around and dude got into some real action, he easily went over 100 yards in his very first NFL game, including a 50-yard touchdown bomb that looked exactly like one that he caught from Burrow while at LSU. Also in that game, he outperformed his college teammate and record-breaking wide receiver Justin Jefferson, who was on the opposing team. And after that day, dude never looked back. On draft day, he made a bold proclamation that he would break every record the Bengals had. And in just year one, he broke the franchise record for receiving yards in a game with 266. And he broke the franchise record for receiving yards in a season with 1,455. And I want to put this in perspective because you can talk a lot of trash about the Bengals, but one thing we've always had really good damn receivers. So for him to just come in and break those records right out the gate, dude is special. He became the youngest NFL player with multiple 100 yard receiving games in a single postseason, broke the NFL record for receiving yards in a game by a rookie, and also broke the record for receiving yards in a postseason by a rookie. The Burrow to Chase connection helped the Bengals go from worst to first and make it all the way to the Super Bowl, proving that he wasn't just the stat sheet stuffer, but he actually made timely impact plays that directly led to winning games. In the Super Bowl, he matched up with Jalen Ramsey. And despite Joe Shiesty having zero time to throw, Chase still managed to catch five passes for 89 yards against the league's best. And if not for what's probably the worst offensive line in Super Bowl history, going up against one of the best defensive linemen in NFL history, he would have finished off his first NFL season like no rookie ever had. Catching a game-winning touchdown in the Super Bowl but it wasn't meant to be. In just one year, Jamar Chase changed the game in many ways. You're starting to see more teams pair up quarterbacks with their college wide receivers, something that really had not been prioritized before Burrow and Chase. Also, his ability to catch a short pass and turn it into a 50-yard gain is rare. A lot of people like to cite Tyreek Hill as the only player in the league who can do this, but he's no longer the only player that does this pretty damn routinely. Jamar Chase does the same thing. He even did it last year against against the Chiefs. But Jamar still definitely has one thing he can tighten up, and I think most of y'all know what that is. On occasion, he does have a tendency to drop a few passes. And according to NBC Sports last year, he was tied for the most. Nine drops on the season is not great, but for perspective, he was actually tied with perennial pro bowler Keenan Allen. And you can see other notable receivers like Debo Samuel, Tyreek Hill, and even Justin Jefferson hovering around this mark. His ability to create explosive plays on both short and long passes and the consistency in which he did it, plus the attention he began to draw from defenses midway through the season, made the drops well worth it. And because of everything he brings to the the table that honestly weren't a huge deal. Still, with that being said, this is something Chase is gonna want to clean up going forward. But the thing I really like about him is that he always catches the ones that really count. And the bigger the game is, the better he plays. And that's something that looking at stats on the sheet won't tell you. And now with the Bengals shoring up that O-line to give Burrow more time to dissect defenses, Chase is likely to only get better and better as the years go by. So we covered each and every one of the last 10 offensive rookies of the year. Hope y'all enjoyed the video, man. Hope y'all got something out of it. But my name is Flimlaw Raps, and I'll catch y'all boys in the next one, man. Peace.